Madam Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it, it was a very intense uh, week for Ukraine and uh, uh, considering the uh, crisis inside the government. And uh, you've been the part of a, a meeting inside the presidential administration with other G7 ambassadors, talking about the crisis, talking about priorities, because for many foreign partners of Ukraine, the resignation of the Ministry of Economy was a, a red sign that something is not going very well inside the country. And I'm gonna, I, I want to quote from start um, an uh, um, editorial inside Kiev, uh, of Kiev Post. And they are very harsh on what happened. And they say that the only way that the West can get the government's attention is to cut off their aid. Um, we suggest Western leaders keep using the financial weapon until Ukraine's rules act in the national interest and stop their fake campaign against corruption. Uh, would you side with the uh, things and descriptions of an anti-corruption campaign as fake in Ukraine? Look, I think the first thing to say is it's been a difficult week in Ukraine. We can all see that. And it's, it's not common that ambassadors of the G7, or in fact more widely, as we saw with the statement last week, uh, get involved. But I think the international community has a huge stake in Ukraine. Um, and you're absolutely right. Uh, there is a significant amount of support coming from the international community into Ukraine to build that safe, stable, and prosperous future that we want for Ukraine. Now, in order for that to proceed, we need to be reassured, I think, of two things. One is that reform proceeds, uh, and proceeds in a way that is sustainable, but changes things fundamentally for the good. And the second is that corruption is tackled because until corruption is tackled, it will continue to eat away at Ukraine and strangle progress in this country. So these two ele elements are absolutely fundamental. Um, that is why a group of ambassadors reacted as they did last week, because we do see ourselves as stakeholders in Ukraine's future, and we want to work with Ukraine to make Ukraine succeed. So is this resignation that happened, uh, how, how much is I mean, how crucial is that resignation for the process uh, of continuing reforms? And I'm not talking personally about the minister, but because with the minister, uh, a lot of his deputies uh, quit and then other ministries who then came back, but still with a really uh, harsh uh, ultimatums. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. This isn't, and it shouldn't be about personalities. The fact is the Ministry for Economy is a key partner in the reform effort uh, and actually uh, under Minister or previous Minister Abramovichius had delivered real progress as we said in, our, said in our statement. So it's absolutely vital that that work continues uh, within the ministry and of course more widely. So if you have somebody who has been the face of reform for Ukraine, who is engaged heavily with the international community, tendering their resignation and of course doing so with some very serious allegations at the heart of that, then of course that's going to have uh, ramifications and of course people need to respond to those allegations. But speaking of corruption, mm -hmm. because it's a crucial issue right now, um, a part of uh, all other reforms that the country has to go through, uh, corruption is always a two-way street, right? You cannot blame just one side of accepting bribes. There uh, could be, uh, there, there is always a second side who uh, pays those bribes. And we've been talking a lot with uh, ministers and then who are tied to reformist process inside the economy. They say that foreign companies are also keep paying, some foreign companies keep pay paying bribes to Ukrainian officials and you know, it supports the corruption. How do you make sure that it's not just uh, bashing one side, right, with uh, not enough effort to combat corruption, but taking some effort and stop uh, foreign companies from paying those bribes too? I mean, I think the way to tackle corruption is from the very top down. Uh, it's very difficult uh, within a country. Uh, and let's be honest, there's a serious problem here. Ukraine is 130th, I think, out of 168 mm -hmm. countries on the Transparency International uh, Corruption Index. It's very hard to tackle unless you tackle it from the top down. And that means that people who at senior levels are not acting in their country's interests, who have vested interests, who are exercising undue influence, need to be taken to task over that. And I think it's very striking that we haven't seen any large corruption cases in this country uh, against people um, who have been accused of being corrupt. So I think that's absolutely important because people lower down the scale will look and say, well, actually, if, if that person is carrying out uh, uh, corrupt activities, 
then actually why shouldn't I? Um, so it's absolutely important from the very top down to be seen to tackle this issue. In terms of foreign companies, um, I can't speak to specifics, but what I can say is that a country like the United Kingdom has very strong laws that relate to companies' activities overseas. So, for example, if a British company were to pay bribes in Ukraine, that would be an offence under British law, even though it takes place in Ukraine. And that's absolutely important for us, and I think that's one of the reasons why we don't see the level of British investment in Ukraine that I would really like to see. Part of my job as an ambassador is not just to work in the political sphere, is actually to promote trade and investment between our two countries. That's how the world works and that's how uh, we build greater ties and, and greater stability. That's really difficult when Ukraine has the reputation for corruption that it currently does. Uh, absolutely. Uh, when it comes to reforms, and we cannot ignore uh, this conversation about anti-corruption reforms or any economic reforms without talking about the war. And the uh, peace process is under a great strains at the moment with increasing violence in Eastern Ukraine. And one of the main uh, pushing points of the foreign partners of Ukraine is to go through all the way with the uh, uh, ceasefire negotiation mm -hmm. in Minsk too. Well, uh, one of the crucial points of this agreement is decentralization reform. It seems like it's not going through the parliament. The opposition inside the parliament, political elites, and also the public doesn't like the idea of political decentralization or special status for Eastern Ukraine. But at the same time, without this, um, there is uh, no, uh, no point of talking about means to uh, finalizing. What would you say to the you know, Ukrainian public that opposes decentralization reforms and doesn't see, uh, according to polls, the means to a uh, peace agreement as you know, uh, helpful or in favor of Ukrainian interests? I think the issue of decentralization has become very complicated, um, I think precisely because uh, of the conflict and because of the Minsk agreements. Um, for a country the size of Ukraine to be as centrally run as it is, um, is quite extraordinary in today's world. And I think if you talk to many people I talk to, actually say decentralization in itself is not a bad thing. And I would agree with that. And I speak coming from a country that is not only decentralized, but devolved uh, responsibility uh, and authority in certain areas. It's a difficult process. There is debate along the way and there's discussion uh, and, and that is absolutely right that a sovereign country has those debates and those discussions. So that requires a major cultural shift, however, for a country as heavily centralised as Ukraine. Yeah, mostly, uh, and a lot of capacity building at a local level because, of course, devolving power and responsibility, you need to make sure that the people at the local level have the capability and the equipment to deal with that and are not just suddenly presented with a huge amount of responsibility without an understanding of, of, of what that requires. So I think there is a debate to be had. Clearly, the Minsk agreements have rather mixed into that debate uh, and, and made it about something slightly different. Um, but the Minsk agreements are on the table. There are obligations for Ukraine to fulfill under those agreements. There are also obligations for Russia to fulfill. And let's be clear, uh, when we're talking uh, to those involved with the Minsk process, the UK is not part of that. We're very clear that whilst Ukraine has obligations, Russia does too. Uh, and we're very firm on that, uh, which is one of the reasons why there are sanctions in place. Yeah, it's about Russia fulfilling her obligations. So I think that is something that will need to move forward uh, as time moves on. Uh, it is something that is absolutely right for Ukraine to do, but clearly that is a Ukrainian sovereign decision uh, as to how that decentralization should be delivered uh, and how civil society are engaged in that debate uh, and how that is meshed with the obligations under the Minsk uh, agreements. It's a very good thing that you mentioned um, the role of Great Britain in the, uh, in the whole process of uh, just to say normalizing the atmosphere and the situation in Ukraine. And you as a new ambassador with your uh, experience in the region, and you've been an ambassador to Georgia before that, um, there are a lot of parallels obviously with Georgia going through um, the similar crisis with, uh, with the war with Russia. Uh, but when it comes to your priorities um, as a new ambassador, we, we've seen a lot of uh, politics and negotiations and involvement, for example, of most and foremost of American embassy with a, a peace process or with the negotiation about reforms. Um, do you, when it comes to your priorities, what kind of priorities will you take? Is it going to be geopolitics, politics, reforms, or some issues tied to humanitarian uh, situation that it's not being tackled very well by anyone in the country, uh, honestly speaking? 
I mean, I think our priorities are very clear and they're very simple and summed up in one sentence, which is our priority is for Ukraine to be stable, secure and prosperous. You know, that's the big strap line, if you like. And we achieve that uh, by working across a range of areas. And I'm very lucky that I have an embassy in Ukraine um, that has a DFID presence. We have a defence section. We have a national crime agency section. So we're trying to work across the piece because we have a number of priorities to deliver that. It's, a hum it's an amazing task, actually. Mm -hmm. But I think it's about supporting Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. It's about supporting reform, and that's through technical assistance uh, and, and providing uh, expertise uh, that will help. Mm -hmm. And it's about peace building uh, and stability as well. You're absolutely right to mention the humanitarian piece, because I think sometimes it's all too easily forgotten that the heart of this lie people's lives. Um, people in the Donbass who didn't ask for conflict, who've been displaced, and those who remain. Um, and who find themselves in a very difficult humanitarian situation. And we have a humanitarian program here. Uh, access is difficult, and I think that's one part of the Minsk agreement mm -hmm. that we want Russia and the separatists to really fulfill, which is to allow access for international uh, NGOs. It's difficult to provide the assistance in. But also, I think, more that can be done for IDPs in this country and for those who are living along the line of contact, who, through no fault of them, their own, find themselves caught up in conflict, uh, and find daily life very, very hard. We ran, as an embassy at the end of last year, a photo exhibition mm -hmm. which detailed personal stories from IDPs. And I think that's really important to remember that these people, they are individuals, they're, they're living today, they're living in Ukraine, some of them are living elsewhere. There are very human stories of personal suffering and tragedy, which we need to make sure we don't forget when we're talking about the bigger geopolitical uh, things. And that's a tour that is now uh, that's an exhibition that is now touring around Ukraine. When it comes to international aid, and mm -hmm. aid that comes from Britain, for example, uh, there, is a, there is a constant problem. Uh, for example, like in 2014, Ukraine got just 20% of international requested aid. Uh, last year it was a bit higher, but still it's not nearly enough. And you're working as a bridge between two countries. How do you explain or how do you uh, reason with you know, British public when it comes to Ukrainian crisis, why should they care? Well, I think the UK has got a good track record in this. I mean, if you look at what our Prime Minister has committed to, which is 0.7% of GNI going on international aid and assistance, and the United Kingdom is one of the few countries uh, that has achieved that, I think we have a very good track record. Um, the problem is there is an awful lot to do in the world, and there are some very big crises out there. I think, you know, as an ambassador, I would always like to see more. Of course I would, particularly when you live in country and you hear the personal stories uh, of people. But I think there is a lot of hard and good work that is going on at the moment to try and reach those people who really need that humanitarian assistance. And I think part of that is actually about making sure that people understand their stories and they're not forgotten. Because I think with a lot of crises around the world, when the new cycle moves on, the suffering doesn't necessarily, and it's absolutely incumbent upon us all, not just diplomats, but journalists and others, to make sure that people are reminded that these problems are still very much there. Well, in helping out development of the country, um, one issues are important like economy and uh, GDP growth and you know, following the anti-corruption uh, fight uh, fully. The other thing that we're talking more about right now that Real development cannot contain just economy or GDP growth. Real development is when the society is stronger, and civil society is strong, and all uh, people are, have at least basic access to their, uh, the, their civil and human rights. Well, when it comes to Ukraine, Ukraine has a number of issues when it comes to civil rights related to the war with war crimes uh, committed by both sides or, for example, uh, issues with the LGBTI community and rising violence against queer people in this country. And you know, local political elites say that, well, we'll have a war on our hands. This is not the case. I mean, that's not the moment for us to be concerned of this. The next week, there's going to be a trial against those people who attacked Kiev Pride last, uh, uh, last uh, year. 30, 30 people were arrested. Just three made it to the court hearings. And you know, likely, they will not get sentences uh, accordingly to the level of violence. What do you say to political Ukrainian political elites and reason with them why it's important to have a, compre a comprehensive development program, including expanding access of all Ukrainian citizens to basic human rights, at least, and protection of violence and then civil rights? 
I mean, it's an area we also work in, uh, and we do work in with partners here. I think the key to all of this is actually Ukraine's future. Um, Ukraine has chosen a European path that is closer ties to the European Union, which is a union that is based on some pretty fundamental values, uh, and they're around diversity and tolerance and respect for human rights uh, and respect for the individual. If you go back to the initial essence of the European Union, its creation in very early format um, in the 1950s followed uh, the Second World War, as we would term it, or, or the Great War here, uh, and the fundamental idea being that the closer we are together, uh, the more likely uh, we are to avoid uh, such a terrible thing happening again. And that's about respecting difference and it's about equality uh, and it's about rejecting uh, discrimination and intolerance. So I think Ukraine's future lies, I think, with closer ties with Europe. Um, that is, I think, what Ukraine's best defence is, if you like, in terms of being a more prosperous uh, nation that defends those rights. Um, and it's absolutely right um, that that debate continues because the debate about ties with the European Union is still very current here. So yes, there's an awful lot on Ukraine's plate at the moment, that's absolutely right, but we cannot lose sight uh, of human rights. Uh, we cannot lose sight of the need to protect people who are vulnerable and the need to promote equality. So this should be going on even in times of war. That's, you know, if you face a regular Ukrainian and he says, like, that's not important. We have, you know, an enemy uh, knocking on our doors. So why we should care about gay people at all? I think it's a fundamental human rights issue, um, and you know, you've absolutely said, you know, there have been, you know, some some really quite terrible incidences of violence and harassment against Murders. LGBT people in Ukraine. There's, you know, it's absolutely right that in a democracy where there is rule of law, people are held accountable for their actions uh, and punished in accordance with the law. I think you know, whatever is going on uh, at the time, that's absolutely important. Um, I, I think there's a sense that you know, these issues are, I think, more broadly about rights. I mean, clearly that it's very important on the LGBT strand, but actually disabled rights, women's rights, this is part of a larger package. And I think some of the discussion we saw at the end of last year uh, around the passage of legislation in the RADA was quite interesting. There was a heavy focus there on LGBT rights, but actually this was about tackling discrimination in the workplace. It was about equality, and it was about protecting people. And I think that's absolutely crucial if a country wants that greater relationship with the European Union, uh, which we want it to have. Thank you so much for joining us.